Hey, happy new year. Welcome to the third year of hell. Welcome back to Marks and Chill. Today we're reading the ninth chapter of the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844 by Karl Marx. I know I acted like I was done with this series, but I totally didn't do the last chapter <laughs> and I feel really guilty about it. So anyway, let's finish it today. Oh, and by the way, I know it's taking me very long to come out with videos now because I'm trying to go at a more manageable pace. So follow me on TikTok if you get bored. I'm posting there a lot more often. But anyways, let's get started. Today's text is titled The Power of Money in Bourgeois Society. We're going to discuss what it means to have money for the upper class. If the feelings, passions of humans are a true affirmation of their existence, and if the feelings and passions of humans are really affirmed because their object exists for them as objects they experience through their senses, it is clear that number one, the manner in which the object exists for them is the specific way in which they provide gratification. Number two, whenever the sensual affirmation is a direct annulment of the object, drinking, eating, transforming the object, then this disappearance is the affirmation of the object. Number three, as long as humans and their feelings are human, then the affirmation of the object by another is their own gratification. So if somebody else validates my feelings, my passions, or for example, somebody tells me I'm intelligent, then that intelligence belongs to me. Four, only through developed industry via private property does the existence of human passion come into being in its totality and its humanity. The science of humans is itself a product of human's practical ability, meaning only through making stuff, private property, does human passion come into existence. And number five, the meaning of private property other than its estrangement is the existence of essential objects for humans, both as the objects of enjoyment and the objects of activity, meaning there are two sides to private property. It is the reflection of human existence, my passions, my feelings, my talent. But remember, the process of creating private property also brings estrangement to me. By possessing the property of buying everything, by possessing the property of appropriating all objects, money is thus the object of distinguished possession. The universality of its property is the omnipotence of its being. Money is a procurer between human needs and the object, between their life and their means of life. That which mediates my life for me also mediates the existence of other people for me. So the most distinguished possession one can have is money because it can own all objects. That is the power of money. Money obtains the things you need to live and it can also help you obtain the existence of others to serve your own life or existence. So Marx quote this poem by Goethe titled Faust and he's quoting Mephistopheles which seems to be some kind of a demon in this story and I'm sorry if I butchered that. And the lines that really stand out to me are the following. Six stallions say I can afford. Is not their strength my property? I tear along a sporting lord as if their legs belong to me. Marx then goes on to quote Shakespeare's Timon of Athens and the lines that really stand out to me are the following. Gold, yellow, glittering, precious gold, no gods. I am no idle votarist. Thus much of this will make black, white, foul, fair, wrong, right, base, noble, old, young, coward, valiant. Then further down in the middle, he says, this yellow slave will knit and break religions, bless the accursed, make the or leprosy adored, place thieves and give them title, knee and approbation with senators on the bench. This is it that makes the weapon widow wed again. I don't know if I said that right. <laughs> Come, damned earth, thou common whore of mankind that puts odds among the rout nations. So Marx goes on to explain, Shakespeare excellently depicts the real nature of money. That for which I can pay, that is, that which money can buy, that I am myself. The extent of the power of money is the extent of my power. Money's properties are my, the possessor's, properties and essential powers. Thus, 
What I am and I'm capable of is by no means determined by my individuality. I am ugly, but I can buy for myself the most beautiful women. Therefore, I am not ugly, for the effect of ugliness is nullified by money. I, according to my individual characteristics, am lame, but money furnishes me with 24 feet. Therefore, I am not lame. I am bad, dishonest, unscrupulous, stupid, but money is honored and hence its possessors. Money is the supreme good. Therefore, its possessor is good. Money saves me the trouble of being dishonest. I am therefore presumed honest. I am brainless, but money is the real brain of all things. And then, should its possessor be brainless? Besides, they can buy clever people for themselves. And is a person who has power over the clever not more clever than the clever? Do I not who thinks the money am capable of all that the human longs for possess all human capacities? Does not my money therefore transform all of my capacities to their opposite? If money is the bond binding me to human life, binding society to me, connecting me with nature and humans, is not money the bond of all bonds? Can it not dissolve and bind all ties? Is it not therefore also the universal agent of separation? Is it the coin that really separates as well as the real binding agent, the chemical power of society? Shakespeare stresses two essential properties of money. One, money's visible divinity, which is the transformation of all human and natural properties into their contraries, into their opposites. And number two, money is the common whore, the common procurer of people and nations. The distortion and confounding of all human and natural qualities, the fraternization of impossibilities, the divine power of money, lies in its character as humans estranged, alienating and self-imposing species nature. Money is the alienated ability of humankind. That which I'm unable to do as a human, I am able to do with the means of money. It converts my wishes from something from the realm of imagination, translates them from their imagined or desired existence into their sensuous actual existence from imagined into being real money is the true creative power of course the demand also exists for that person which has no money but their demand is the imagination without effect or existence therefore it remains unreal and objectless and the difference between those two is that one remains imagined and the other remains well the other comes into existence if i have no money for travel i have no need that is real realizable need to travel if i have the vocation for study but not the money for it then i have no vocation for study on the other hand if i have no vocation for study but have the will and the money for it i have an effective vocation for it money is the external universal medium and faculty for turning an image into reality transform the real powers of humans and nature into what are merely abstract notions and therefore imperfections Money is thus the general distorting of individualities which turns them into their opposite and confers contradictory attributes upon their attributes. Money then appears as this distorting power both against the individual and against the bonds of society. And since money as the existing and active concept of value confounds and confuses all things, it confounds and confuses all natural and human quality. Even though you might have those needs, if you don't have the money, it appears to others that you don't have the needs or that you don't have the desire. So that to me is really key of what is the power of money to rich people. Rich people can actually express all their needs and desires. And they look like they have more needs, more desires, more qualities than everyday people because they can simply have the means to express them. Money then appears as this distorting power both against the individual and against the bonds of society. Since money as the existing and active concept of value confounds and confuses all things, it confounds and confuses all human and natural quality. Those who can buy bravery are brave, though they might be cowards. As money is not exchanged for one thing but the entire objective world of humans and nature from the standpoint of its possessor and therefore serves to exchange every quality for every other even if contradictory. It is the fraternization of impossibilities and it makes contradictions embrace. If you assume humans to be human and their relationship to the world to be a human one, 
Then, and only then, can you exchange love for love, trust for trust. If you enjoy art, you must be an artistically cultivated person. If you exercise influence over people, it must be because you are a person with stimulating and encouraging effect on others. Every one of your relationships to humans and nature must be a specific expression corresponding to the object of your will, of your real individual life. But if you love without evoking love, well, then your love is impotent, a misfortune. And what that final part says to me is that rich people, they can buy all the qualities and they don't need to cultivate any of those qualities at all. For example, a rich person can buy all the greatest paintings in the world. That doesn't mean they're actually educated or in any way artistic. And after reading this text, that's the first time it ever makes sense to me why so many people adore people like Elon Musk. Because Elon Musk, I think, is just an asshole. But he can buy all the intelligence that other people around him can possibly provide him with, right? And that's why he's able to lead these great companies because he can afford to buy other people's intelligence as well as their labor. And somehow money makes it appear as though it's Elon Musk that has the intelligence and the power of work, but it isn't. It's just the ability of money to transfer those qualities to the person that possesses the money. Even though this was a really short reading, I thought it was really interesting. It was something that I didn't understand until now, so... And that's really all I have for you today. To be honest, I'm not sure if I'm gonna read ever the critique of the Hegelian dialectic and philosophy as a whole because I honestly just don't get it. <laughs> it just has nothing to do with anything we're talking about. <laughs> and also like, I don't really know what the hell it's talking about. <laughs> but I do really want to get into another Marx text moving forward. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you still are, subscribe if you'd like to continue talking about world domination. I hope that you're doing okay. I know we're still going through a lot of weird stuff. But yeah, good luck with everything and I'll see you in the next one.